Well, I am glad to be here. How many of you glad to be here tonight? Yeah. Amen and amen. I am excited and thankful um, for the opportunity to connect. I was kind of taken by surprise. I thought I entered a college campus tonight. Uh, I, I saw so many of you, and I was like, good grief, okay, you know? So uh, I guess we are in a wonderful place. Once I, one thing I sense in here um, that I sense is a, a, a deep, all I've heard, and, and I, I get to go some places. I don't teach at those schools anymore. I've scaled my life down. But um, one of the things I get a sense of is a seriousness about disciple making. Um, I, I could sense it from the guy in the parking lot. Um, seriously. Um, <laughs> Um, because, you know, I, I, I get to go someplace. I don't travel as much as I used to uh, anymore. And um, if I can, y'all put a timer on me, please. I just want to make sure y'all put a timer on me somewhere. Okay. And um, it's rare uh, where you feel like and you get a sense that a ministry is built around disciple making. And so I, I want to let you know and encourage you to not take that for granted. Um, because we are in a culture of deconstruction, and much of that deconstruction has happened in the context of a lack of life touch and the extension of God's spirit through the lives of other people. And so as we are in this society tonight, I could sense the communalness of you all, and I just Pray that the grace of God would give you hope that if any of you ever go through a struggle, remember the life that God used to life on life you in a place like this. Amen? Amen. 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 You can start the clock. You got to start the clock on me. You just got to start it. Um, <laughs> you just got to start it. Um, I see 50. Yeah, there you go. Go ahead. You know, just, just start that mug, man. Uh, <laughs> Let's, let's go before the Lord. I, I understand I'm supposed to speak and give uh, some moments for uh, question and answer. Lord God Almighty, maker of all things and changer of minds and souls. Lord, I pray that you would uh, throw your weight around by your spirit and direct us and develop us so that we can be more effectively and effectually conformed to the image of Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, our strength and our redeemer in whom we trust. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody agree with that said? Amen. amen and amen. I'd like to thank the pastors of the different, from what I understand you're structured based on house churches that scatter and gather. And so all of those leaders and uh, senior leaders and uh, uh, groups that lead and help shepherd the flock among you. Uh, shepherds lead feed, care, no protect. Let's give God a hand praise for those leaders and those shepherds. Amen. Well, I've been given the task to talk about while weakness is your strength. Um, I, I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. 2 Corinthians the fourth chapter. I'm a little old school. I know we all dress down, but if you don't mind, can you stand while I read this? If you don't mind. If you can, if you can't, well, I understand. I'm reading from the CSB. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7, we'll stop at about the 10th, the 11th or 12th verse. Now we have this treasure in clay jars so that the extraordinary power or the surpassing power or the surpassing greatness of the power may be from God and not us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted but not abandoned. We are struck down but not destroyed, always carrying the death of Jesus in our body so that the life, somebody say life. life, life of Jesus may also be displayed in our bodies. For we 
who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. You may be seated. Why weakness is our greatest strength. I mean, we live in the filter society. I mean, you can go on social media, you can go on TikTok, Snapchat, uh, even now, Facebook had to adjust. It's like a, Facebook is like a social media junk drawer to me. Just every time a new app comes out, they just add all the stuff so that nobody will get away from their app. Uh, sounds like some churches I know. But what, <laughs> oh, that was a low blow. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That was a low blow. That was a, forgive me, Jesus. Um, forgive me, Jesus. Woo, that was a low blow. Um, <laughs> and so, um, but, 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 but when you can make yourself, you can have bunny ears, you can have long eyelashes. You can have the hairdo you want. You can make your face glow, your eyeliner change, your beard. Have, if you can't grow a beard, you can grow a beard. You have a mustache, you can take it away. I mean, you literally can create yourself in kind of whatever image that you want to create yourself in. In other words, in, in, in our society, you can present your best. I mean, you can present your good side, your, your best side, the best looking side. You can, you can close the room off acting like there's no junk in the room. And this one part makes it look like you're in a palace. Because we live in a world where weakness is something to not toil with. And only time weakness is publicly communicated is to garner... Uh, 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 people to be in, uh, 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 kind of uh, strengthen your ego because you're feeling bad about yourself and you're looking for your identity through social media. So we live in this world, and so we live in this world where, where either weakness is shunned upon or weakness is used as a tool for personal ego development. But in the Bible, it's interesting. I did a paper when I was in grad school in the 90s. And I did a paper where we had to do what's called a sanctification paper. And in this sanctification paper, we had to take one theological ideology from the New Testament and go from every book from Matthew to Revelation and, and, and take those passages, set them aside, exegetically study all of those passages, and develop a philosophical construct biblically based on that particular one. And I remember in 205 at Dallas Seminary, my professor, Dr. Lowry, said, it'd be interesting for someone to do theirs on suffering. He said, no one has done it. I said, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and so as I began to, to isolate these various passages, uh, 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 and, and I began to see how much the New Testament talked about suffering and how much it talked about challenge, I began to see that directly connected to spiritual growth is difficulty. You, 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 you cannot, even though difficulty isn't the only way that you grow spiritually, you grow spiritually by being in God's word. You grow spiritually by connecting to uh, 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 being in biblical community and discipleship and in prayer and uh, uh, all those different things. But uh, 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 those things are things that you reach for. Suffering is not something you reach for. So God has to schedule it for you. <laughs> and God schedules it without asking you when you want it to happen. And so here, Paul, I call him the gospel globetrotter. Um, Paul begins his soliloquy with really a chip on his shoulder towards the Corinthians. He has this chip on his shoulder towards the Corinthians because he is absolutely frustrated with the fact that they don't respect his God-ordained authority in their life. He, he's not trying to lord it over them. He's not trying uh, uh, to be abusive. He's just trying to use the spiritual authority that Jesus Christ has given him as a non-molesting mechanism to minister the Messiah to God's people. And so he comes here and he begins telling you, you know, you all know the Corinthians. Corinthians, see, you know, you know, y'all got a big church, but it's not, it's not like highfalutin, Right? Well, what do I mean by that? See, when I came in here, I didn't see nobody in tight suits and certain, th certain you know, the, the, the upper nose vernacular, you know. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see pipe organ. There ain't nothing wrong with pipe organs, just a nice church. But I did, didn't get this air. But the Corinthian church uh, 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 was a little bit of a highfalutin church. 
I mean, when I say highfalutin church, if you look at 1 Corinthians, there was a lot of wealthy in there, and they flaunted their wealth in front of the poor. I mean, it would have been the church with Blickley's and Phantom Rolls Royces would come up in front of the church, and the parking attendant wouldn't be a parking attendant. It'd be a valley attendant. (laughs) And so they valued the high life. But there was a remnant there, but for the most part, the church culture was skewed by a bad understanding of what life in Christ looked like. And it was so much so that they only valued leaders that had wealth and that, that, that strutted their stuff and that maximized how they looked in front of them. So Paul says, well, I'm the wrong dude, family. He said, because, he said, because listen, I'm going to tell you what qualifies me for ministry. What qualifies me for ministry is not the side of the railroad track I live on. What, 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 what puts me and sets me up in ministry is not how good I look, but it's what God has used as a suffering qualifier to help me to be sanctified and to look like Jesus and bring me through stuff so that I can bring him to you. And so when you go to the Psalms, I mean, he's literally talking about being broken. Somebody say broken. The Bible says in Psalm 34, 18 and Psalm 51, 17, it talks about God being near to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. In other words, when, uh, uh, God isn't like people in your school that when uh, 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 you're the nerdy, uh, 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 ugly looking one over there. I'm not saying nobody ugly in here, but. It was, <laughs> and he scoots his chair up to the least. That's what he does because brokenness. In the Hebrew, it means to be shattered, crushed, maimed, devoid of arrogance, wounded, contrite, injured, smashed, grieved, distressed, crippled, wrecked, demolished, fractured, handicapped, and disabled. Listen, being dependent on God or broken is the spiritual state by which one is disarmed of his or her self-dependence and pride. So Paul begins to illustrate that, but if I can... Spurgeon says brokenness is wholeheartedness of heart from sin and the malady. I'm talking about the malady. The brokenness of heart may be considered two ways. First, in relation to wholeness of heart in sin or so brokenness of heart is that which one depends on God. One speaker said to me one time, he says, brokenness and weakness in God's eyes is living in a constant state of God neediness. And so, let me give you some things, and we'll walk through this text, and we'll answer some questions, hopefully. Signs that you need to be broken. Number one, insecurity. You are supremely insecure. I'm just, we're going to come back to some of these in a second. You're hyper-independent. Now, now God didn't mean for you to be hyper-dependent, but he made us to be dependently independent. What does that mean? Galatians chapter 6 says we should bear one another's burdens. But then it also says everyone should carry their own load. So there's a sense in which the Christian life and walking with God is a load that you carry under Jesus, under his yoke. And then there's some stuff that gets too much for you where other people add their yokes to yours so they can help you through a hard time. But then some of us, another one is prayerlessness. Dry eyes, you don't cry. You know how guys are, I ain't gonna cry, I'm good. You know, ain't nothing wrong with me. You know, dry eyes. Secrecy, you're, you're unknowable. When you, if you're going to be a disciple, in order to get discipled, a level of your life has to be opened up. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Isolation. You isolate yourself all the time. Bible says, he who isolates him or herself seeks their own desire. You're unteachable. You know everything. Ain't nothing worse than somebody before you finish saying something, they run in their mouth and ain't experienced nothing, nothing in their life. Right? Anyone, anyway, let's dive in. First point. If you're going to be one who understands why weakness is your greatest strength, (laughs) how does this happen? You got to recognize that God's put power in troubled vessels. God puts power in troubled vessels. Look what he says. He says, now we have this treasure in clay pots or clay jars or jars of clay so that the extraordinary power may be from God and not us. 
And, uh, and, and in other words, he calls us clay pots. Now, I, I don't know if you understand clay back then and what clay pots were used for. But back then, you know, they wouldn't put, they didn't have the type of treasuries that we have, the safe deposit boxes uh, uh, readily available. So in their homes, they had gold vessels, they had silver vessels, and they had bronze vessels. These were the vessels that you put your pearls in. Pearls back then was worth more than diamonds. So you would put those in those vessels because you put, the, the, you put what's valuable in the type of vessel that reflects the type of value that the, the item is in. However, Paul does something confusing and countercultural as Jesus always does. What he says is God doesn't choose nice looking vessels to put good stuff in. He chooses tore up from the floor of vessels. <laughs> Why would he say clay jars? Because that was the bathroom. What is the treasure, though? Tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's the glory of God in the gospel. It's the glory of God in the gospel. If you understand the glory of God in the gospel, the Bible says the gospel is the power of God. It's the content of the gospel and it's the scope of the gospel. And when he says it's the power of God, the gospel is not just a message that saves. It is a message that sanctifies and gives you the fullness of scope of life. It's weakness and strength in a multivitamin pill. That's what it is. It's God's omnipotence put in a message. And so when he comes here and he says, we have this treasure in earth and vessels. In other words, God chooses to put treasure in inconspicuous vessels. Okay, y'all looking at me funny. Let me see if I can break it down. See, 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 God, let, let, let me explain something to you. God, I, I said this before, God is not a good picker of people. He doesn't pick well. In other words, if God went up the street to y'all basketball court, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and they were playing a pickup game, full court. And they had to pick up two more. And, and, and the team out there, you know, they ran in terror. You know, you know, like tongue all out doing everything. And God the Father, he's just on the sideline. And God the Son, he's showing some gum. He said, Pops, who you want to choose? And he looked over there. He said, Shorty over there. Yeah, Shorty. <laughs> so they like, you going to choose them? Oh, we're going to sweep them three, man. We're going to sweep them. Everybody think they're good. But, but, but they don't know how God works. So they get on the court, and all of a sudden, they got skill. They said, we should have picked them earlier. Them two, why didn't we pick them earlier? Because you didn't think they had skill. Why? Because of whose team they weren't on. Now they're on their team. Why? Because God never is a talent scout that seeks out skill. Never. He does not need your skill. He gives it. When he drafts you on your team, he expects you to bring nothing to the table. That's weakness. Weakness is saying, I have nothing and you have everything. And at that point, you're qualified to be a vessel of mercy. <laughs> See, that's the beauty of being in the Messiah, in Yahshua. Paul begins to saying, listen, family, listen, listen, God's Value is placed on you because of who he is. God didn't look from eternity past into eternity, into time future and saw what you were going to be and was inspired by your greatness and chose you. <laughs> He's not inspired by you. Like Al Pacino in Devil's Advocate, I'm a fan of man. No. So, I'm sorry, I went over some, go watch the movie. <laughs> God's not our fan. We're not his hero. Oh, this is so countercultural. Because in our preaching culture, we teach that God is just, just needs us so much. No, Scripture teaches we need him. And so Paul is preaching backwards of what the Corinthians were used to. And he goes even further, which is really homiletical suicide. Because this homiletical suicide that he's committing right now is really to make God bigger than man. <laughs> so he goes from the fact that God puts power in the vessel. Why? Because he says, so that the surpassing greatness of the power 
may be of God and not us. That means God wants you and I to model him on the planet. Meaning, God has something called a time fashion show. <laughs> right? You are to wear his glory on earth. You know, no music plays. You know, you just walk out on the runway of life and you're killing it for his name's sake and you're doing your thing. <laughs> That's because the surpassing greatness is supposed to be from him. So when you're weak, when you're weak, I'll, I'll, I'll ne- I, I, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I got to go to the next point. Let me go. God puts power in the vessel, but remember your clay. So now, how do you get the power out? He puts pressure on the vessel. (laughs) He puts pressure on us. Not just allows, but puts. Look at what the text says says in verse, so he said, we are afflicted in every way. We are afflicted in every way, meaning everything sometimes just goes wrong. See, many of us don't recognize that when everything, all quiet, it's okay. <laughs> Some stuff is not amenable, it's thinkable. <laughs> afflicted in every way, he says, but not crushed. God that, that Paul is talking about everything going wrong in his life. Listen, when you walk with God, it's confusing. It is. I mean, when you're making disciples, loving people, trying to walk with them, and then all of a sudden, your car breaks down. <laughs> when you get my age, you walk up a step, your knee just pops for no reason. <laughs> you're like, what, 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 what just happened? You, you make a move and your back just stops, and you got, you're looking like... Uh, You're a mannequin, just. (laughs) But then there are other times where someone in your family gets cancer. Someone loses a child. But you, doing the right thing, think that you earn God's favor to not go through anything because you're serving him. (laughs) And that's when the confusion happens, and that's why Paul says, we're afflicted in every way but not crushed. We'll come back to that, but not crushed in a second. And he goes to something that happens because, because what ends up happening is confusion in our life. And what does that confusion look like? It's interestingly enough, it says, perplexed, but not in despair. It's interesting. Very interesting. Whenever difficulty happens to someone that's trying to walk with the Lord, you, it's okay to be perplexed, but it's not okay to be despairing. What's despairing? Loss of hope. What's the loss of hope? Loss of hope. What is hope? In order to know what loss of hope is, we got to understand what hope is. Y'all striking with me? Hope is the visionary picture of a preferred future that Christ forms. It's vision. It's the ability to see things different than it is now, looking forward and expectantly towards it. That's, that's, that, 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 that's, that's hope. A uh, uh, hope, you can't even have faith without hope. Why? Because my Bible says in Hebrews 11, 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for. So without hope, you can't have faith because without hope, you can't picture what God is promising in order to believe God for it to happen. So when he says perplexed but not despairing, despair is the loss of hope. See, because we teach a fluffy God sitting up in heaven. We teach this sucker Jesus who runs through, runs through and, and tickles Peter and they, and. You know, we teach this Jesus that's, you know, just. We don't, have, I mean, seriously, we, we literally confuse people. If one more person reduces God to love, I'm going to scream. Because 
He is love, but your definition of love means he doesn't give you a whooping. <laughs> so when you get a whooping, you're confused. <laughs> like, huh, you don't love me, huh? Why? And what happens is when you have a bad view of God in your weakness, you pull away from him. So that's why we have, when you, under, when you grow in your knowledge of God better, that's why theology proper is important. That's why Bible is important. That's why theology is important. That's why discipleship is important. Why is that important? So that you can understand God so that when something happens, you have a category for it. But when you have no category for it, you begin to despair because you begin to charge God with stuff he's not guilty of. So he says, when something bad happens to me, I'm in despair. No. He said, I get perplexed. Now, perplexity is okay. <laughs> perplexity is, this is what perplexity looks like. God, I love you. But I don't understand what's going on right now. <laughs> I'll never forget. 22 years ago and six months and almost 10 days. I remember I was in my last class, and this is the one time I didn't go with my wife to the doctor's appointment. And she was six months pregnant with our first child. And I got a call, get to the hospital now. There's no heartbeat. Now, you have to understand, I'm in seminary. I'm walking with Jesus. Me and my wife waited till we got married, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, we were on staff. We were working in the inner city. So guess what? God, you owe me a child. You owe me not to let my child die. How about that? Now, I ain't say it like that, but you know, we... We talk respectfully in prayer, but in our heart, we sassy. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and, 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 and I was driving up 75 trying to figure out God at that moment. I had two and a half years of Greek, two years of Hebrew, a year of, of church history, and none of it was helpful with the moment that I was in. And I can remember asking the doctor, to show me the heartbeat. And she was laying in my wife's belly with no heartbeat. Sonogram on it. Usually you'd hear that pound that you would hear. It's a beautiful sound of a human heartbeat. That's why we value life in the womb. Beautiful sound. And the doctor said, no, and I prayed, God, you're the resurrection and the life. Uh, John 11. No heartbeat. And our little girl, Naomi, Michelle Mason passed away. Guess what I had to learn? I had to begin to learn weakness and strength. So I said to myself, Eric, be strong. You got to be strong. Be strong for your wife. Be strong for your family. <laughs> My wife laughing because she remembers. And... I remember her, she's sitting right there. And I sensed the Holy Spirit bringing up the last chapter of 2 Corinthians, chapter 12. And he said, in your weakness, I'm made strong. I'm like, God, you know, I didn't say this, but I was like, quit the riddles. Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> like, it sounds deep. He says, stop being strong. <laughs> what do you mean? He said, the strength that you're standing in is your own. He says, stop it. He says, enter the experience of your pain. I was like, what? Grieve. Remember Job, I let him grieve. Remember when Isaac's mother died, he grieved. When Jesus' best friend, one of his boys died, 
He grieved. On the cross, he said, Elohi, Elohi, Lamastabasana, grieve. And I entered in, and I don't know what began to happen, because it's possible to feel the weakness and the pain and still think rightly of God. Still saying he's good, but I don't understand how goodness works itself out and what happened to me. That's perplexity. That's perplexity. Perplexity is like, God, two plus two isn't equaling one spiritually right now, or four, or whatever it is. I'm confused. You can tell what kind of schooling I got. Um, he said, that's what's not the problem, Eric. That's the problem. But, and I began to learn that being acquainted with weakness is you stripping of self in order for God to enter in and go beast mode for you. So God wants to maximize his glory in your life, not in the times where you're the most sure, but where you can find and experience some of the worst and frustrating confusion in your life. Not only that, my wife, after our first child, had a transplant, her first transplant. Right after she got her first transplant, right, well, before that, we had our first child, my son. He was in ICU for six weeks. Prayed for him in the morning, lunchtime, after work, and before bedtime. Drove back and forth in the hospital. After that, my wife got a transplant. After that transplant, she got cancer in the new liver. So you know God is like, and, and so I'm like, okay, God. Okay, so, so, so if you are allowing this to happen to me, something's going on that I need to learn. And so what we began to do, my wife and I, was embrace, and I'm not talking about being a masochist and not believing in healing. We believe in healing. We trust God for healing. And, but there are times when he doesn't do it. And when he doesn't do it, what do you do and what do you think about him? So she has cancer. Then she has another surgery. Then she has eight surgeries after that. Then we're in a hospital and no one knows what's wrong with her. And she's in there and a woman is, uh, uh, or one of her texts is from Ukraine. She barely spoke any English. My wife was like, why am I in the hospital, God? So we're in there. And my wife just started sharing the gospel with her. And there were some barriers there. And then all of a sudden, uh, she said, can you read a Bible? She said, no, I can't read that Bible. She said, I'm really more fluent in Ukraine. Well, my wife had a woman that discipled her that was a missionary to Ukraine. She got the Bible, the Ukrainian Bible, from her mentor, gave it to the woman. The woman broke down crying. Now, what are the chances of her being sick in the hospital where that tech was, her being black, with a Ukrainian missionary spiritual mother <laughs> who's white in Texas. <laughs> Listen, man, some of your darkest moments are opportunities. Some of those moments, I've learned more in the gutter than I ever learned in a high rise. Listen, we have to do inner city ministry. We're in 95% unchurched Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And so you, you, you know, I, wanted, I ain't want to go to the inner city. I say, I ain't. I, that's exactly what I said. <laughs> I wanted to go to a more, you know, affluent area. Not that any area is better, but because I knew what it was going to be like. But God has a sense of humor. And so God puts us there. And I'm like, God, how from here, because I'm perplexed, but I'm going. You know, sometimes when you mature, you just learn to go. And God figures it out. I mean, you, no, you figure it out. God, you got to figure it out. You, you try to figure it out. You're like, God, I'm going, but you just know, I don't know what the heck is going on. So we get there, and I'm trying to wonder. I had all this vision. And I said, how is it going to come through a neighborhood like this? So next thing I know... A guy, a guy ended up connecting with me. I began discipling him. I become a spiritual father, a spiritual father of a group of guys. He ends up 
we end up, we're not even ready to plant churches yet. And in the midst of this perplexity of still planting, being faithful, but like God, what in the world? We ended up bringing him on staff. I still don't even know how this day he got brought on as a resident. He ends up, God raised him up in our ministry. He gets, as our first church plant in Camden, New Jersey. Worst city in America five years in a row. He goes over there and he starts a ministry with dogs. No lie. Broken, weak, trying to figure things out. Going to dog shows, you know what dogs, you know, do all of this and they look around. Well, his dogs come in there because they them hood dogs, you know. They don't, <laughs> different kind of dogs. Then I go bounce, they go, oof. Right? And in the midst of that, the worst drug dealer in Camden was in the dogs. Gained common ground with him, led him to Jesus. That guy began calling all the other drug dealers to Jesus. Then from that church, we ended up playing a church in Delaware, Hard City in Wilmington, Baltimore, Maryland, South Central L.A., Brooklyn, New York, Best Side. And all of this began happening because of a yes in the midst of weakness. Never underestimate what God can do in the midst of weakness. Look at what Paul says. I got to move. He said, we are struck down, but not destroyed. He says, we always carry, this is crazy. He said, we always carry the death of Jesus in our body. It's a sense of weakness. That's what he means. It's a sense of weakness, but it's our strength. Why? Because God doesn't cause you to walk in weakness to walk around in weakness. He calls you to walk in weakness so you can tap into his strength. And what he allows and causes you to go through is a mechanism, listen, for helping you to grow and develop. And some of you are in the early stages of your life. And so some of this is for another season because whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not, or whether you understand it or not, there are three phases to life. Those three phases is you're in a trial, you're coming out of a trial, or you're going into one. Those are it's three phases. So let me just explain something to you. Stop being confused. Just know, listen, I, when, 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 when things are nice, I'll be like looking over my shoulder. I said, man, it's too nice right now. Holy Spirit's like, enjoy it, dog, because... <laughs> Listen, that doesn't mean we, we, we walk in fear, but, but the goal is as you mature as a Christian, you begin to say, like me and my wife, we'll go through some church stuff and we'll be looking at each other. We're in another one, huh? She's like, yep. And we'll begin to look at each other and what we have to begin to do as you grow spiritually, you begin to use your death tools. Your death tools. Dying to self. Because you know we are some brats. We want what we want, how we want it, when we want it. And we have to begin to say, God doesn't owe me anything. We have to remember that. God is good. And God is doing something. Count it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect work in you. And if anyone lacks wisdom, that's what we got to do, babe. Let's ask for wisdom. How do we, so what's wisdom? What's the, what's the, what's the Sophia, the chokmah, right? Um, the, the, what, what, what do we need to be asking God for? Because perplexity asks for wisdom. Because you don't know, because you and I see in a glass dimly. And so we need that gospel wisdom that God gives to help us to make sense of the foolishness of this fallen world. And that's what it's going to be like until he comes back. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, family. One goal and one goal only in your life that God has. One goal. People always like, what's my purpose? Am I supposed to be a doctor? Am I supposed to be a lawyer? Am I supposed to be a teacher? I'm like, that's not your purpose. Your vocation is never your purpose. It's an extension of it. But your purpose is Romans 8, 29. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ. So guess what? Everything in your life is booby trap for you to look like Jesus. <laughs> Everything. 
that moment when somebody says something and you want to clean cuss them out. Now, I know y'all don't want to do that no more because y'all are the disciple making church. <laughs> but those of us who have the creep called the tinge of unholiness creeping after us, <laughs> trying to slither, we have to remind ourselves. But let me tell you something. God's goal is for you to look like Jesus. So in that relationship, he's trying to get you to look like Jesus. That inability to pay tuition, trying to make you look like Jesus. That friend that misunderstood you and there's nothing you can do. The more you explain it, it just gets worse. <laughs> trying to make you look like Jesus. You were lied on trying to make you look like Jesus. They exposed you, but you blaming them. He's trying to make you look like Jesus. <laughs> he does all of this to make us strong. I'll close with this. You know, weakness is always to make you have verified strength. There's a difference. There's a difference when I, back in the day, when I used to weight lift, and I did, no matter what you believe. <laughs> I started using creatine. Now, that's, that's, that's some of the OGs in here know what I'm talking about. But creatine is water weight. It's really not muscle, it's hydrating your muscles to look like they're more muscular than they actually are, but they really don't have the full density that they're supposed to have if you just ate protein and just did the lifting. <laughs> That's many of our strength, but God wants real strength in us. I remember a friend of mine, he, was, he ran a 4-2, nasty, nasty 4-2 running dude, right? And at one time he was in practice and he got hit in a practice scrimmage and and snapped, I don't know, the fibula and the tibula went pow, <laughs> snapped it. And he was so angry and his adrenaline was flowing that he couldn't feel that he had broke it. And he was so mad because he, 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 he was concerned. So, so when he went to the doctor, he's sitting in there and he's mad. And he asked the doctor, he said, doc, he says, will I ever be able to run again? He says, well, it's interesting that you asked this. He said, look at my diagram. He looks up at the diagram and looks at his bone. He says, see, this is a clean break. He said, this is a good break. He looking like, a good break? <laughs> How in the world can I break my leg and that's a good break? He said, oh, it's a good break. That's a good clean break. He says, because the way this is gonna heal, the bone is gonna reinforce around it again. And when it reinforces, it reinforces itself with stronger material. He was like, mm. <laughs> and he says, actually, this bone will be stronger after it's broken than before it was broken. Because if this wasn't broken, your leg wouldn't be as strong as it's about to be. But in order to experience the strength that you're going to experience, there had to be a breakage in order to reinforce it with greater strength than it had before. That's what God does in your life during your difficulties. He reinforces the place that he breaks with a greater sense of divine strength than you and I will ever have. And I can tell you that when the Bible says the testing of your faith produces endurance, it gives you the ability to have a higher pain tolerance and threshold. And guess what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1? Your pain threshold will get so great that when others who don't have your pain threshold goes through what you've gone through already, you comfort them with the pain threshold that you got comforted with by God resealing you with greater strength in order that they will learn how to walk through that trial. What's that called? Discipleship. <laughs> and so no matter where you are, you're going in, you're coming out, Watch my fingers. Um, <laughs> or you're in a trial. It's all God's will. Listen, some of you are preparing for stuff. That's not your purpose. No, it doesn't even start. Your purpose doesn't start with the goal that you have ultimately to be. Your purpose starts here. Now, matter of fact, your purpose starts 
when you are born again. <laughs> Immediately. You don't become a disciple. You are by identity. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. I'm telling you right now, as I began to grow, I began to appreciate God's ability to help me to show the beauty of the strength and weakness that's in him through Jesus Christ. Father God, we thank you. We honor you and thank you for where you are and what you do and how you strengthen and transform us. How you conform us to the image of Jesus. Um, I pray that our lessons will be learned in this. Maybe someone's here today and God may be spoken to you and through his word and you've never met God the Son as yours to embrace him by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone, plus nothing. <laughs> Your life opportunities is greatest in him. He made him who knew no sin become sin on our behalf. Huh. God poured out his wrath on Jesus and he did in six hours what it would have taken us an eternity in hell to pay for. So if you're here today and you've never said, I'm not talking about the cheap grace thing, I'm talking about the real reality of placing your confidence in him. That's you. And I know you guys are near each other and people are near. Slide your hand up, I would love to pray for you. Anyone that says, I want to place my confidence in the Most High. In the Most High. Anyone that says, I want to say yes to him. Even if you're at the other locations, whoever's there overseeing, if you could look out, anybody wants to place their confidence in him. Maybe very quickly, I have two minutes for this part. If you're here and, 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 and you're working through this weakness strength issue, I'd like to pray for you quickly. So if you are here, you want to stand where you are. You're a believer, but you're saying, yo, this hit me, and I need strength through this. Just stand where you are. I want to pray for you, if that's you. Anyone? I see you. Thank you for being bold. Anybody else? Thank you for being bold. Your God, you're, you're, you, you, I need your strength. I need to understand and begin the process of understanding this weakness strength thing. Anybody else? I see you in the back. Thank you for your boldness. Thank you for your boldness. I see y'all. I see you, brother. Even at the other locations where you are, I see you in the back. Thank you for your boldness, brother. I see you, sis. Anyone else? I see you. I see you. Lord God, I pray for those who have stood. Jose, um, I know this is true. I just need the Holy Spirit's help and strength to help my heart and mind to be wrapped around this as a reality. So God, I pray for them that whether they're in, coming out, or going into, that you would strengthen them by the power of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit, and give them clarity. And endurance, help them to walk in the fruit that they already have. We don't have to ask for endurance. We don't have to ask for self-control. We don't have to ask for you've given all of that to us. We just have to access it. Help them to access the spiritual hard drive through the app store in their soul. Download onto their hard drive everything from your word that's needed for them to re rebrood it, to walk with you with veracity and resilience. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, uh, we're going to jump into it, but there's a couple cars blocking the exit. 
How dare you? <laughs> if you're parked on Community Park Drive, you're blocking an exit that's uh, to go out. So these two license plates uh, and make and model, go move that. All right. Eric Mason. We appreciate you. That was moving and lightning. Uh, I forgot I was going to come up here and ask questions, and I was just writing down notes for myself. So forgive me. Uh, you talked about the brokenness being disarming of this self-dependence, the pride, weakness, saying, I have nothing and you have everything. A Jesus that tickles Peter. Uh, I got a lot of good stuff. <laughs> a few questions for you. How do you, people work through doubt and anger with God in, in tough times without becoming despair and falling into that? Beautiful doubt? question. Um, one of the things the church has to do better in discipleship is invite doubt. Um, that's why, I mean, I don't want people doubting outside of community. Um, Thomas doubted in community. He doubted right in front of Jesus. That's a pretty good place to doubt, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so I think that we view doubt, I, I, don't, I don't know, we feared doubt, right? And so I think that um, we feel like, like no one ever had their, all of their questions answered in order to get saved or stay saved. Nobody. Anybody in this room, raise your hand if all your questions got answered for you to trust Jesus. It's not. And so we as believers have to take the pressure off of ourselves to thinking that the key to their sanctification is me answering all of their questions. Um, sometimes the real sanctification issue, because the Bible says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the things that are revealed for man, the things not for God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we see into a glass dimly. So there is a sense, and that, that's not a cop out. That's, and that's not anti-intellectualism, but rather it's that sense in which, hey, if someone's doubting um, that God is good because of some, ex you know, some type of crime to happen or some type of bombing or different things like that, I think that's a good time to wrap our minds around the reality of some stuff we understand, some stuff the Bible talks about, about theonomy. A the that's a good opportunity to talk about the theology of the theonomy, which is the theology of suffering and how that works. And for people to understand that, like, it's funny, people always ask, where was God when this happened? I said, well, when the sun was shining, you didn't ask where he was, did you? <laughs> they was like, no, I didn't. I said, so why do you blame God for what bad happens, but don't thank him for the things that's good? And so I said, balance that out, you know. And so just helping people to work with it, particularly our church is full of millennials. And so that's a, that's a huge piece of us working through some of those things. And we're in a, you know, we're in this society, this whole deconstructing culture, uh, reevaluating our core beliefs. And with that happening, I think it's a great time uh, to help shape those core beliefs. I think the church is supposed to teach what to think and how to think. Um, and so I think it's both and, not either or. Because somebody said, I just want to teach people how to think like they can figure it out on themselves. Jesus said, teach them all that I commanded you. That's not teaching them just how to think. It's teaching them some actual things, yeah. right? And so, um, and, so, and, so, so that, and then letting people, listen, and trusting people to the Holy Spirit. Mm. Like, trust. It. I'll never forget when we first started and one of our leaders, he was always saying, hey, nobody's listening and nobody's listening. And, and one of our younger leaders said, said to him, he said, when are you going to learn to minister to people and entrust them to God? And, and, and it shattered his whole frame because he was realizing that he was encroaching the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Wow. That's good. Yeah. Thoughts on preparing our minds for suffering, uh, for, for that phase of going into a trial. Uh, what's the best way to, to shore things up and be ready as a Christian for suffering? Uh, to get into it. <laughs> and what I mean by that is you don't know how prepared you are until you're suffering, right? Um, but if you're, tr if you're trusting in God, and again, I emphasize in community because a lot of people just want to do everything alone, and the devil loves isolation. He loves it. I watch a lot of animal programs with my kids. 
<laughs> and I can tell you right now, the polar bear, the lion, the tiger, uh, the killer whale, which is actually a dolphin, as my oldest would say, um, <laughs> they all love isolated calves. And the devil loves isolated believers. Mm. And um, that's, why, that's why theology should be done in community. Not decided in it, but done in community. And um, a lot of times getting in those trials and dealing with those difficulties and then beginning to get into passages, for me that was helpful, and hearing the experience of others either on my playing field or in other seasons, but then also those one another's. You know, I tell people all the time, I minister sometimes to a group they call Hebrew Israelites, and they believe we're supposed to keep the law. And they say, we're supposed to keep the 613 laws of the Old Testament, and they tell telling all this stuff. And I say, well, you know there's 1,050 laws of Christ in the New Testament. So there are actually more laws of Christ than laws of Moses. Mm. <laughs> so why does that matter? That matters because those one another, some of those are one another commands a community that really is a grace to help us to be there for people and not always give them answers. Because answers isn't always the thing that keeps people. Being there for them and serving them and encouraging them is also another thing, an uh, uh, outlet for love as well. Yeah. And, and that, that's what was helpful for us to make it more personal because I think that when my, my daughter died in the, in, in the hospital, um, one of my dear brothers was there and then 30 people from our church showed up. They were on the side room and they were praying and they were there. And even though my daughter didn't live, the memory of them being there strengthened me. Mm. But okay. they didn't say much to me. They didn't give me no Bible verses. They were there. Mm. And that was a memory to sustain me that God cared. So, yeah. Love that. Noticing a community theme here in brokenness uh, and what that can do. Uh, you talked about our culture's tendency to put a filter on everything. Uh, we're, we're, we don't want to be, be weak. We want everything to look good. How do you personally lead people into openness and vulnerability, especially with our culture going the way it is, of, that it's just not okay? Yeah, I think one of the things, I mean, I give, I, I'm not saying you should get on stage in front of everybody, so, and then just tell everybody everything. That's not healthy at all. Um, <laughs> You know, because Proverbs does talk about discretion. And those ideas of discretion is talking about their levels to relationships and there's levels to community. So there's everybody in community isn't mature enough for certain levels of spiritual intimacy with you. Right? So you have to begin to have categories for that, right? And so, but but I do oh, ask me the question again. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was going on the, the yeah, thing. It was good. I was ready for wherever you were <laughs> yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you lead people into open yeah, yeah, and vulnerability? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, <laughs> so I think um, basically what I do is based on the sphere that I'm in, I admit things. Mm. So if I'm exhorting someone on something, um, I show them where I failed in that. And in that, they're like, oh, so this is something that all believers work through. And... What that begins to do, it doesn't give them the freedom to now begin to walk deeper into that failure. But what it tells them is, is that everybody is in a process. Listen, I tell people all the time, we're a mess in process, right? And so we, 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 our, our sanctification is becoming less messy every day, mm. right? And so that, that's a very important part of vulnerability is a, is, is a huge part of that. I mean, you can't read the Psalms. You know, most of the Bible speaks to us, but the Psalms speak for us. And many times in, the, in, 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 in that art, that's the beauty of art, is art says things that you can't say or that you don't know that you need saying, but it says it for you. That's the beauty of the Psalms. And so Psalms is an example of massive vulnerability for us. Even Job, Job is actually a, it's, it's in the poetic books. And so even in there, you see the vulnerability. You go to Habakkuk chapter one, you see the argument with God between Habakkuk, like, like he's really arguing, but really his struggle and his vulnerability in what he was dealing with. You see uh, Hosea dealing with, uh, you see uh, Hosea dealing with the vulnerability of engaging God about Gomer. So you see that all through scripture. And I think we need to give people that side of it as well. Yeah, that's wise. I'll tell you what, uh, when we like someone here, they definitely get invited back. I think we'll see you again. So, I mean. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you for exposing the word for us. Thank you for, for bringing your, your openness and vulnerability to the stage tonight. We appreciate you. So let's hear it for Dr. Mason awesome. again.